Good morning, guys. Um, so today I want to show you um, how to create connections, socket connections um, in C++. And um, this is something that you'll be using in your programming assignment uh, three as well. Okay. So um, there are basically two types of socket connections that you can make uh, in your programs. Um, you can either connect through UDP or TCP. Um, we'll learn more about this and other types of sockets in 466, but um, for now these are the two, and these are really the two main kinds of sockets that people create. Um, and you can think of, uh, of UDP as unreliable data transfer, where we basically just shoot some data and hope that it gets there. And you can think of TCP um, as reliable stream transport. So uh, we'll be sending streams of data and we have abilities on the sender and the receiver to process not just single messages, but really read data from, from a buffer. So UDP or user datagram protocol is connectionless. Um, you can send data even if you don't know if the receiver there is present. There's no setup connection out there. So you basically, it's kind of just like yelling data and hoping that someone hears you. There's no flow control. Um, so you may send more data than someone can receive. Uh, there's no congestion control. Anybody can send as much data as they want into the network and mm, potentially congested. And there's no guarantees on anything. Um, such as end-to-end -end delay, the throughput you can get, or the security of the connection, right? So it's literally just taking some bytes and shooting them over. Now, the reason everybody doesn't do it in the internet is kind of nice. Uh, developers understand that sending unbounded TCP is a bad idea. And in the rare instances that um, this was violated, people put in uh, firewalls and um, to, to control the amount of data that can be sent into their networks. And so, um, even though generally people behave, um, there are ways of restricting UDP traffic. And so even stuff that uh, applications that really just need to send s slow messages or small messages, they will tend to use TCP just to get through firewalls. Okay, so that brings us to TCP, um, where to send data, you first need to establish a connection. So there's some agreement between the sender and the receiver that um, they, they are ready to communicate, they will be communicating, and they set up buffers on the sender and the receiver such that uh, data going back and forth can be saved by the operating system. Okay, there is flow control, meaning that the sender will not send more data than the receiver can um, has memory for. Okay, so there's some kind of information going back and forth about that. Um, again, details will be in 466. For now, you can just know that this exists. There's congestion control, um, meaning that the sender will pay attention to what's going on in the network and not send too much data. The way the sender knows this is by getting acknowledgments from, from the receiver for the data they're sending. Okay, so if there's um, no acknowledgments coming back, that means, oh, maybe some packets got lost, maybe I should reduce my sending rate. Um, and so TCP also doesn't provide too many guarantees. So for example, it doesn't provide you any guarantees on end-to-end -end delay. That still depends on the network. This is not a real-time protocol, though there are some protocols that uh, try to add real-time into the networks. There's no guarantees on throughput. You're gonna get as much as the network um, supports and as much as the receiver can receive. And there's no security built in. So to do that, you would need to use something like uh, TLS, okay? Um, but, TCP will try really hard to deliver everything that you send, um, and it is going to guarantee that it delivers stuff in order. So you don't need to worry about uh, messages or bytes arriving out of order, as you would need to worry about in, in UDP. Okay, so let's look at the connection setup process for, for TCP. Um, this is very clever, but somewhat complicated unless you kind of understand the mechanism. Um, so it's maybe not complicated, but not intuitive um, until you think this through, okay? So on the left here, we have a diagram of how the connection process is set up. And on the right, we have the server and client code color-coded. Um, I've written this in Python. I think it's a little bit easier to um, 
kind of understand on a slide, um, the mechanisms in, TC, in uh, C++ are basically the same, even though the code is a bit more complex. And I will show you guys a live example of how this works in uh, C++. But um, it's quite similar, and I think Python is, is easier to read. Okay, so we start with, let me get my pointer. Okay, we start with the server and client, and both server and client are going to begin by setting up a socket. Okay, so they're setting up an AF INET socket, which means um, an IP socket. This is kind of um, old naming of things, um, dating back to the ARPANET. Um, and they're going to set up a socket stream as opposed to socket datagram. So it's a socket for streams, which basically means TCP. Again, old naming. Okay, So both of them, both server and client, end up with... Um, a socket S. Okay, and so we have those two sockets. Now the server is going to bind the socket to a particular IP um, and a port. Okay, so the IP means that um, the socket is bound to connections coming in from this IP. Okay, or you can set this to be any IP, like literally any IP such that um, you can accept a connection from anywhere. And the connections will be coming on port 80. Port 80 is the commonly used port for um, web services, okay, for web servers. Um, so we bind the socket to this port and now um, it's kind of sitting there, okay. Then server is going to go into the listening portion, which means it listens for um, some number of connections. Here we specify this to be one, okay. So we go through, we have a socket, we bind it, and then we start listening. Once the server is listening, the client can start connecting to it. Okay, so the server, so the client set up a socket and now it says connect the socket to a particular IP on port 80. Now, the client needs to know what is the IP of the server and we can use DNS to uh, get that information. Okay, so, um, or you can hard code it like in this example. And on port 80, which has to match the port that the server is listening on. So the client connects, which, um, sends a bunch of packets back and forth. Um, it's called a TCP handshake. Um, for now, you guys don't need to know what this looks like. We'll look at it in 466. But at the end of this process, um, they are uh, connected or a connection has been started. Now, the server then needs to accept the connection. So we go um, down here. And the server accepts the connection and gets two things out of it. It gets the address of the client, right? Because at this point server doesn't know who's connecting to it. And it also gets a new socket called the connection or we call it con or connection socket. Okay. So the socket S keeps on listening potentially for more clients if you set this to a higher number, but the connection to this particular client is identified on the server by this connection object. Okay. So we get this connection socket. And from that, once that has been done, um, the client and server can start communicating with each other. Okay, so the connect will block until this process, until the connection is accepted, and when the connection is accepted, this returns, and now the client can start sending data into socket S. Okay, um, and then when the client sends data, the server can receive that data, and this is a blocking call. So the client will wait to receive some data up to the size of a buffer. Okay, so this is um, a buffer we declared uh, somewhere else in the server code. Okay, and so we can get data and then we can send this data back as an echo message. All right, so that's the connection process. Um, the reason it's like this is that we can have one socket on the server that's advertised on this well-known port and many clients can connect to the server and every time a client connects to the server, there's a new accept call um, and a new connection to this particular client. Okay, So let's look a little bit more deeply as to what happens with these sockets. So we have a client at this IP address and we have a server at this IP address. Now, the server starts by having a socket bound to um, this IP address and port 80. The client can connect to it, okay? And so the connection is initiated from its IP and some random port, though you can specify the port 
to if you want to, for example, if you need a connection on a particular, from a particular port to get through a firewall, to the IP of the server and port 80. Okay? When the server accepts the connection, there is a new socket that's created um, between port, um, uh, between the server port, um, uh, the server address and server port, and now this is a random port created for this new connection and the client IP and the client port. Okay? So each socket is going to be identified by this four tuple, which is the uh, server address, uh, server port, client address, and client port. Okay? So um, that's how this goes. Okay? Um, let's look at an example of doing this in C++. So I set up some code for you guys. Um, and this is going to be in um, the CSCI 366 um, examples repository. And so on the server, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. a little bit bigger. Oh, wait, not the code. Okay, it's a little better. All right, so here's what's happening. So on the server, we need to first set up the connection. We're going to call it the listening socket, okay, or listen socket. So we set up an IP socket, AFINet, and we set up a SOC stream, meaning TCP socket. Uh, protocol zero uh, it's just has to match IP. You can basically always put zero in here, okay? You're, you're pretty much always going to be communicating over IP unless you're doing something really weird, okay? Um, and so we make sure the socket has opened. All right, now we're gonna do, we're going to set up socket options um, and set them to true. So we're gonna set as opposed to unset these sockets. And the idea here is that uh, we are going to allow new sockets to be created um, by stealing the address and port. So even if we run this program multiple times and we have a socket kind of open but not properly closed, this will just steal the address and port and open a new socket for you. Okay, so next we're going to bind the socket. We need to set up um, this address structure, which includes the fact it's an IP socket. We're gonna allow connections from any address, not just, um, not just a particular IP address. Okay, and we're going to start these connections on a particular port, which is defined up here. Now this port has to be higher than 80 if you want to run this process without using sudo. So any port numbers below 1024 will require sudo access because these are reserved ports. Okay, so we can just set up connections on or start listening on port 8080. And then finally we bind this socket, we bind the listen socket um, using this address structure. Okay, um, once the socket is bound, we can start listening on that socket. Okay, and we can here accept up to three connections, doesn't matter. Um, we'll just listen for one. Um, we can do multiple connections if you're doing multi-threaded type server. All right. Um, so once this returns, um, now we can, oh sorry, no, so this will return right away. And then we're going to try to accept connections. So if there's a connection coming in, um, you can accept it. And then this will return. And now we get this new, um, then we'll get this new connection socket, okay? Actually, I'm not super sure right now if this is going to stall or if this is going to stall. Um, should have probably tested it out because I forget, but basically one of these things will wait until there is a connection and then you can kind of move on with your code, okay? So maybe the listening box, um, we, we can test it out. Maybe you guys can test it out. Um, so anyway, once a client connects, we'll be able to go through this process and get a connection socket. Okay. Once we have the connection socket, we can start reading data from it. 
to read data, you basically need to set up a buffer into which data will be read. So whatever data is received goes into a buffer inside the operating system. Then we need to read from that buffer into the buffer in your application. So you create a buffer up to some, with some number of bytes. And then you can read from the socket, from the connection socket, into the buffer up to some number of bytes. Now, we can read up to 1024 bytes, so we can here simply pass the size of the buffer. But if you want to read only maybe 20 bytes at a time, you can just put 20 in here, and then you'll read 20 bytes into this buffer. Okay? Once the read completes, it tells you how many bytes it was able to read. So we can print that out, and then we can also print whatever data we received, which will be in the buffer. Um, and now we can send a reply to the to the client through the connection socket and we'll just send whatever the client sent to us. Now, you have to be a little bit careful because through sockets you, you basically transmit bytes um, and strings only work if they're zero terminated. So if you want to print a message from client, there's an assumption here that whatever the client sent is in fact zero terminated, zero terminated and can be printed out as a string. Um, if you're sending arbitrary data, that's still cool it's just not going to be zero terminated, so it might not read properly. Okay. Same thing here when we're sending this, when we're sending data back, we assume that it's zero terminated because we're sending data from the buffer, and the number of bytes we're sending is the string length of the buffer. Okay. So to compute string length, you need a zero termination in that buffer so that this returns something reasonable um, that's less than the buffer size. Right? If you just want to send 20 bytes, you can just put 20 in here. Okay. So then on the client, we need to know, first of all, the address of the server and the port of the server. So these have to, the ports have to match. The client also needs to know the address of the server. Here we're using this address, which is specifically means local host. Okay? So we're going to have both client and server running on the same machine. You don't actually need to know the address of this machine you can just specify this local host address and communicate basically between two processes uh, running on the same machine through this special IP address. Okay, so we open a socket, basically same as on the server. Um, we're going to set up this address um, to say basically who we're communicating with. So it's an IP address. Um, we're going to use the port of the server. Um, and then we need to set up the address. Now, the address was defined as a string. So we need to convert it into, an, um, into a number, as we discussed in the last lecture, that these things can be treated as 32-bit integers. Okay, So that's what this function is doing. And we're going to set the converted address into this uh, sin address inside our address socket address structure. Okay, so once we have the address set up, we can do a connection to the server using our socket um, that we've created up here. Okay, we pass the address and the size of the address structure. All right, once we have the connection, um, so this will block until we have, until we can connect. Once the connection is completed, we can define some message as a string. So we automatically know this is going to be zero terminated, and then we send it into the socket. We need to convert the uh, C++ string into a C string, so that's what this is doing. And we need to pass the length of the C string um, to tell the sockets how many bytes we are writing into it. Okay. Um, all right, we can print out what we're sending, and then to receive the reply from server, again, we need to set up a buffer. Um, we can read some bytes, from our socket um, and then print out the number of bytes received and the message. Okay, So when we run this, um, we need to start the server first so it starts listening. Okay, So we have a server running and then we can run the client. And here's what's happening. So the client is sending hello from client, that's the message. Okay, so the server receives that. We have 17 bytes received, and here's the message. And now we're going to send the echo to client. And the echo is the same message. So the client says, 
it received 17 bytes and it received uh, the message which was hello from client okay so that's basically it it's pretty simple straightforward um, the code is a little mm, complicated um, but it just basically follows the process that I just outlined in the slides um, in the book the book does this a little bit differently it basically uses this the same functions except it breaks them down into this process of it has a function that sets up a socket and then once the connection is made you have a connection socket on the server and you have a connected socket on the client and then you can use the, those sockets for transmission so you can kind of break this down into break this down into connection establishment and then the actual um, communication part um, all right so yep that's about it for today um, give this a try play with it send data back and forth see what happens make sure this runs on your computer um, and then over the weekend I'll be posting the uh, PA3 assignment where you guys will need to do the communication between the client and the battleship client and the battleship server not by saving files onto the disk and then having the other um, uh, the other process read that file but by serializing your JSON files into a socket and then uh, communicating those bytes through the socket. All right, thank you guys.